Welcome back to In The Booth. I'm Sean Booth, and thank you guys for listening, wherever you're tuning in from. Maybe you are from Baltimore, Maryland. Maybe you are in Adelaide, Australia. We got Australian listeners, Sam Cat. Shout out. And maybe you are from Churchill, Manitoba. Where's that? In Canada. Yep, there we go. Here we go. Off to a good start today. She is back in the studio with us. She is sitting next to my son, Locks Booth. He's in the studio. And today, Sam Cat is wearing, she's got Nike shoes on. She's got blue jeans, an Alan Jackson t-shirt, one of the goats. The goats. Is it your favorite? Uh, he's up there. Top three. He's up, yeah, top three. Of 90s country, for sure. Okay, you heard it. We got Jackson Cat in the building. hey I'll take it. And take to it. my left today, a very special guest, excited for this conversation. He's an actor and screenwriter who exploded onto the Hollywood scene at a very young age. He's appeared in more than 150 movies and TV shows. He's the lead singer for the Oneaters <laughs> and the massive hit of That Thing You Do, a husband and a father. He is Jonathan Sheck. Hey, welcome. You. Welcome. So you have probably seen it all in Hollywood. I think I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> in the 90s is when you started, correct? Yeah. And then still going. Still going, but doing it in Nashville, Tennessee now. Yeah, when'd you leave? 2018. Okay. Yeah. And you were just like, I'm done with Hollywood, off to Tennessee. Yeah, there was there was a lot of reasons why we wanted to move to Nashville. Um, the schools in L.A. were problematic for me. Like every time I went there, I felt horrible about the schools. Yeah. Um, and my son was about to go to school, get get into elementary school. Okay. Um, he's dyslexic, and I knew that he needed uh, learning services or something of the nature, like that would help him uh, keep up. All right. And we thought maybe Nashville, you know, because Julie's from here. And we came out, we went to uh, one school, and they literally, by the time we left here, were like, would Camden like to come? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to buy a house. Yeah. Yeah. They said special services. They they take care, you know, they really look after um, their students, no matter, you know, what way their brain works. Right. Um, and I just, I just, loved it so yeah that's why we moved and that's what we were kind of talking about before was once you have a kid it's all about them now yeah and you can't be as selfish anymore right and you're saying that that's the greatest thing that's happened to you yeah and you have two little ones yeah one boy one girl i have a 10 year old boy named camden and a three-year-old girl named lily joe okay beautiful names and we've got uh producer alex in the building today and he's having a kid on next thursday so uh all the kids in here <laughs> it's gonna be a uh, yeah babysitters club um so a, a lot of people try to go to hollywood try to make it big and most people aren't successful you've been able to do this sustain this career for 30 years now what do you attribute that to hmm. well definitely persistence mm -hmm. but also um just faith Okay. Yeah, I have faith. I have faith in the spirit to guide me to wherever I need to go. Um, as long as I, one reason I moved to Nashville is because the unknown has always been really good to me. Mm -hmm. um, like I left Maryland to go to Los Angeles while I was in school, yeah. in college. I took one acting class, not like I knew what I was doing, um, but I just thought, man, I still had a better chance of doing that than reading these textbooks. And right. I just went into the unknown and just found my way so, um, so i so the same way when Kendrick wanted to go to school and my career was kind of like muddy and it was not going anywhere i just i didn't like hearing the things i was hearing in, in los angeles about where they're going to put me what kind of roles i was going to play and i just went decided that was it we're going to go into the unknown take care of my family go into the unknown and see what's next okay so you didn't have any dreams or aspirations before college you kind of no. just took that one class no way i didn't <laughs> even think that was possible i yeah. didn't even know what an actor really was that's wild yeah and so when you say you thought that they're kind of putting you in one direction as a type of role yeah they they stopped allowing me to play the diverse roles that i was always playing yeah um, i really didn't even know i i knew kind of like what my my dad was and my mom like what areas they were from from europe yeah um but th then hollywood kind of like started to really like i couldn't play anything yeah that wasn't what i was <laughs> yeah what i was and i thought that acting was really about 
stepping into someone else's shoes and yeah. learning who they are. So Okay. So then you made the move out there and explain the process of landing a role with the show or a movie. You got to obviously find a team that can uh, apply for you. You need some representation, correct? Right. And then you just get casting calls. Obviously, got to be very political of who gets to come. Uh, I'm assuming that directors probably have people that they already know are going to get the role. Yeah. So a lot of inside stuff going on. But you just show up and is it like the movies you watch where you got like uh, a line of people waiting to go read a few lines and that's it? Yeah, <laughs> that is pretty much it. Yeah, it's everything. So, you know, the, the director or the producers, everyone kind of has people that they think would be right for the role and they bring them in or they make an offer if they can convince the other people that this person's right. Um, but most in the beginning of my career, the first thing that I ever did as an actor my roommate came home. I had two roommates who were actors, and he came home and goes, Jonathan, you're perfect for this role. It's an open call. It's a Franco Zeffirelli movie. You got to go out for this movie. Um, and I, I talked to my acting coach, and I was like, you know, we, we, we agreed that I wouldn't go out until I was ready. He goes, you're ready. And so I went to the audition, and I, brought, I did, had two monologues prepared. That mm -hmm. was the thing back in okay. 1990. You would have monologues, and I did like, Biff from uh, Death of a Salesman and did these monologues and then went back and back and back and then, then they eventually flew out of all of the thousand people that they auditioned for that role they flew me and my roommate uh, really? to, to Rome and Chinta Chita for Damn. the screen test okay so that was one way and then the other way is you know your agency calls you up and says there's an audition for this they give you your sides that you have to prepare or just a meeting sometimes. And sometimes you'll have people who are just meeting, some people are reading. And then everyone kind of like sees what's what's in the mix, what fits. Yeah. And I'm assuming the same guys that you're seeing at these auditions. Oh, yeah, always. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Sam Cat is uh probably the same of me. A huge fan of that thing you do, right? And we talked about this and one of our favorite movies growing up. And if you haven't seen the movie, you should. Tom Hanks movie. You should see the movie. Jonathan's the lead singer for that group, The Wonders. Is that a role that kind of changed your career in a direction that kind of shot you up there? Yeah. So I, I, I had done a film I had in the can. In other words, it hadn't come out yet. Called How to Make an American Quilt with Winona Ryder. Spielberg produced it. It was with Maya Angelou, um, like Ellen Burstein. There was all these really big actresses it was a very eclectic film and i came out of the pool buff <laughs> and had this scene with Winona Ryder that people just i just was, went off the charts from that really and tom knew knew the the hype that was up about me in that film and so when i came in and read because i went in with a billion people it's when i was smoking i probably smoked a pack of cigarettes just because i was so nervous yeah <laughs> um and I won that role. I won that role today. And I'll never forget when I did that. I literally, I went in the room. Tom Hanks was there. There was a reader, another one, someone who was reading the scenes with me. And I had to do the scene where I quit at the end. So and you started singing. So I, so no, it was the words were, I quit, I quit. And he leaves the room. So I thought he's a singer. He wouldn't just quit. He's, he's angry. He's like, he's a rebel. He's a punk. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, I pretend like there was a microphone in the room and I went, I, I quit. I quit. And I looked at the, the guy I was reading with and go, I quit, Mr. White. And I looked at Tom Hanks and then I walked out of the room. And that was it. No, Tom Hanks come running after me, say, get back in here, kid. <laughs> That's awesome. And I was like, yeah, I did it. I won. <laughs> no one's going to beat that. I'm sorry. I'm just having like a little bit of an out of body experience. I, I, <laughs> Sean and I have joked, I mean, I've known Sean for years, but we've joked about just, I don't know, it comes up very, I feel like pretty quickly in friendships, just like, what are your favorite songs, movies or whatever. Um, since I was a child, uh, I don't mean to brag, but we had a VHS player in the back of our minivan <laughs> and oh, we yeah, had that thing you do. <laughs> yeah, we had that yeah. thing you do and we had Rush Hour 2 and those were the only two VHSs in the Honda Odyssey. So to every gymnastics meet and to every hockey game, that my parents shuttled us around to, we watched that thing you do. So it's just funny to hear a behind the scenes clip because I know exactly 
what scene you're talking about. Yeah. I, I remember what your character was wearing, which is now like you. I'm putting this together. Um, and I could probably quote, I could probably run lines with you now this many years later <laughs> with that. And it's just a, I don't know, my frontal lobe is melting right now, but I love the behind the scenes information. It's the best. Yeah. I bought the CD just for that song. Yeah. Do you get royalties <laughs> from that? No, because it's not me singing on that. Right. Okay. It, it's um, Mike Viola's voice. So the one thing they told me when I got the part, they were like, listen, this whole movie revolves around this song. So we, we're having people write it. We're, we found a couple. We're, we're going to let everyone listen to it, but you're not going to sing the song. We need a professional singer. You, we're going to make you look like you sing it, play it. And at the point when we first went in there, I couldn't play the guitar. But by the time we started filming, I could play the guitar yeah. and I could sing. Yeah. But they weren't going to, they weren't going to bank the whole thing on me. So that was, that was one. Adam Schlesinger wrote it. Um, he's a genius songwriter. He's written many beautiful things. People has huge fan base, big writer. He passed away during COVID. It was ho horrible. Um, yeah. So that's a couple of things about that thing you do. I, when, when I was planning on moving here to Nashville, Tennessee, one of the people I was talking to was Steve Zahn. He lives in Kentucky. I was like, why does Steve Zahn live in Kentucky? So I was like, Steve, why do you live in Kentucky? He goes, why do you live in Los Angeles? What, are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. You'll never make it in that town. <laughs> That's wild. And how was working with Liv Tyler? Oh, she was wonderful. She's yeah. so sweet, so kind. Yeah. Um, yeah. She just did all those music videos. You remember that? Yeah. Yep. That's. I didn't see any film that she had done prior but as soon as she was there she's so sweet and then i had to break up with her so in the, in the one scene in the one scene when he's he he like we were on the recording and they they said that he was engaged mm -hmm. and then i had to break up with her so i'll tell you another behind the should have dumped you in pittsburgh yeah that's what yeah, that one, yeah. <laughs> so that scene when she's saying i wasted a million kisses mm -hmm. i asked the prop guys to give me strings so i could string my guitar as she's telling me because I thought, you know, the reason why Jimmy's this way is because he's worried about his music and he's worried about being taken seriously as an artist. Mm -hmm. And so I'm stringing the guitar, I'm stringing the guitar. And I'll never forget Tom, Tom was directed it. So he kept coming in there and watching me when the scenes and he was watching Liv and he's watching the scene, and he would film Liv. And then he was, when he did this close up of me and then he was like, he kept me doing it over and over again. And I'm like stringing my guitar and finally comes in and he looks at me and goes, it's about your guitar. Right. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so he, he tells, talk to Fujimoto, you know, get a shot of him in this guitar. And that like, that was the greatest honor I think I've ever had from a director. Like, like watch me, I'm doing my part. I'm, I'm telling you the story. And so Tom filmed that part. So that was, Nice. A little behind the scenes. I love that. And so how deep do you go into prep for these roles? So for something like that, is it something that you are practicing when you go home, you're trying to get in that mindset that on every day? Everything. Right. We practiced from the time we woke up to the time we went to bed. It was with the guys. Everyone was in little different rooms playing guitar. I, they hired great instructors. They took great care of us, obviously. And um, we just started the bond as a band. Um so much so that we, for the table read at Sony, we played. Now they had the the playback going for us, but we get up there on stage and 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 just blew them away. And that was that was the band. That was the Oneaters, the Wonders, the Shrimp Shack, Jimmy, and Captain Geach, Captain and the Geach Shrimp Shack Shooters. Shrimp shooters. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> and I see on social media you guys still keep up with one another, and you do events. Yeah, right? the band. Yes, yeah, so we, we've never all, this is really interesting. The four of us have never all been together since we did the promotional tour because we did tour Japan. We played in Japan. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, the band, we toured in Japan. <laughs> um, but yeah, since then, we have never all got together. Now, we were supposed to for our 25th anniversary. The Eerie Sea Wolves play, uh, they changed their name from the Eerie Sea Wolves to the Eerie Wonders for one day. Because the band was uh, original, originated from uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. And so they changed the head, the hats, the logos. Oh. We went up there, but Ethan Embry couldn't go because of COVID. So 
it was only three of us. And there was, we signed autographs for about eight hours. There was a line around the stadium for us to sign autographs. It was pretty amazing. I bet. A rabid fan. And then base. they play, they played the, the movie after the, the game. That's awesome. Yeah. We threw out the first pitch. That's so cool. Dang. Yeah. I wish I would have been there. <laughs> yeah. It was Do so you ever, much fun. I mean, obviously this character was 30, I don't even know, 30 plus years ago. So for someone like me, it's kind of like stuck in time. Is it a weird thing? Oh, bless you, Locks. Is it a weird thing to meet fans down the road? Like, is it ever annoying to be kind of stuck in that character in some people's minds? Or is it always cool to meet people who have like seen your work in past decades? Well, there's two, like, it's a great film. So I'm really grateful to be part of such a great film. But it's it's Tom Hanks. Okay. And I'm grateful to be part of Tom Hanks because that man is incredible in every, every way I've ever could mm -hmm. you could ever imagine. So he comes out here to Nashville and I get to see him more than ever. We've gone to, we've gone, he's come out to Franklin to have lunch with me a couple of times. And, and like some of the places that we went to, I was just like, if they knew what who he, who yes. he is, they don't know. <laughs> yeah. They just don't realize it. Tom like, Hanks. how can you not That's Tom Hanks? Uh, one time we went, we went, went into a, what's it called? The good cup. You never been yeah. to the good cup? And we got there late and I drove up in my truck and we jumped out of the truck and I was, and I was like, oh man, we just missed it. We're at the door and the guy's like the key and he's looking, he's like, oh my God. He, he goes, we will we'll open for you, sir. <laughs> and open it for Tom. <laughs> Tom went in there and bought a bunch of the stuff. It was really amazing. That's wild. Yeah. So that's just a movie that you're super proud of. Yeah. And, so I'm, pr I'm proud of it, but I was the jerk. I did have a kid kick me one time. <laughs> Oh, wow. I was like, it's a movie. It's a role. I was going to say, doesn't that kind of give you a good feeling, though? That means you did your job correctly. Yeah. You were the jerk, but I mean, you're not in real life. So props yeah. to you. Yeah. Well, he, he he was just very serious about his work. He was an artist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got a two-part question for you. Is there a movie that you look at and the role you think you'd be perfect for that you weren't? Like if you saw, I don't know, say Titanic and you're like, oh, I could have been that. Is there a movie out there where you wish you were that role? Yeah, Wolverine. Okay. That's nice. a good one. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to be Wolverine more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. I had a broken, uh, I punched the refrigerator. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I had a cast on my hand. And I went into the meeting with Brian Singer. And there's something about Brian Singer that he was really worried about this cast. Like, what? why did you, why did you hit a refrigerator? Um, and... Yeah, so he just he didn't want me to hit him. Yeah. <laughs> so and I wouldn't have hit him. Yeah. Like when I'm I, I, John Penn saw the cast, he was like, "Oh, yeah." Like it's no big deal. But Brian Singer was like, "Ooh, he's got a cast. He's he could be a problem. He's edgy." <laughs> and what about a role that you almost got but didn't get? One that might keep you up at night. Well, now that I'm a father, um, I would like to been on the CSI franchise and I could have been that guy. Okay. Yeah. I did. I did not do my due diligence. I had done a, a pilot for a TV series that I really want to do with a director named Carl Franklin. Great director off the charts with Mar Marg Helgenberger. I think that's how you say her name. Do you know that ring a bell? She was, and then she went on to CSI and the people, the studio and everything wanted me to move on to something because that pit pilot didn't get picked up but I didn't want to do television anymore. They, yeah. they didn't pick up the pilot that I wanted. So I was like, mm. so I didn't work for like, you know, six months and I got some independent film, <laughs> but I would have been rich if I would have got CSI. <laughs> and so that's part of the Hollywood thing, right? Just ups and downs and ups oh, and downs. You're up and then you got to. You know, it's, it literally is like this wheel. It goes like this. Your career will be down, but you know what? It's going to go back up every yeah. time. For most actors, I think that's the way it goes. I feel like people that end up leaving are the people that just can't handle that. Yeah. 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 A lot of, like I tell my son, like, oh, you're going to, your failure is a big part of life. And you just, you know, he's like, yeah, you're going to learn from your failures. I'm like, it's great. Good job, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now you got a new show out, Blue Ridge. Yeah. Lead man on that. Tell us about it. Well, it's a, it's a procedural. So something happens uh, every week and I'm the t sheriff and I got to figure out what happened. And it's unique. Every, I wouldn't say like every week's a theme, but there's new things every week. Uh, there's just, there's a regular cast. Um, but my character has to, a crime happens in town. He's got to figure out what happened. Um, he's, he's there in that town to be with his family because they, he went through a divorce with his wife and she was gone for a couple of years and he went there to, to win her back. 
um, after making amends to himself and getting uh, one once when once her back, he's broken hearted because he misses her, misses this. He's got a, a daughter, um, and so that's the premise of the show. Really, this whole thing is built around this sheriff. And how many seasons? It, we finished the first season last year, just before the strike. There's six episodes coming out April 7th on the Cowboy Way channel, which is a streaming service. Um, you can get it in like Sling, Roku, uh, different, different. Uh, uh, what do they call them? Fast channels. Right. Yeah, where they run ads on there. So it's like old school uh, television. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Give us some behind the scenes on the TV show making process. One episode. How long is that taken? Uh, eight days. Okay. Eight filming days. So we have the weekends off, which have been great because I filmed in Charlotte, North Carolina. I never thought I'd get to say this, but I get to fly home on the weekends to see my family. Right. Which is priority to them, not just me, which is awesome because I have a three-year-old mm -hmm. um, and a 10-year-old and a wife I love. Um, so, so we film each episode eight, and they kind of overlap sometimes because we use, we have uh, three sets in this in the studio you use those sets all the, all the time mm -hmm. um so if we were there maybe we'll, we'll take episode two and we'll shoot a, a one scene from episode three kind of stuff like that okay yeah and is everybody kind of you're just filming on one spot or other actors actresses on a different set filming at the same time no it's just, all there's once. one crew yeah okay. there's a a camera and b camera okay so the two two camera crews not all the time but most of the time Okay. And my my DP Brent Christie is since he's awesome. Yeah. He moves he kept cap, gets it. And we move move on. Okay. Because usually you know filming is a grind. You hear like you hear like Conor McGregor talk about um, Roadhouse and how hard it was to be eighteen hours on the set, and it usually is. It's it's ridiculous the time that they pay you to wait really. Oh. And then they're like go. <laughs> you got to yeah. learn how to go. Yeah. Um. My television series, we're just a well-oiled machine, as they would say. Okay. Yep. Yeah, even in my short time on TV, those filming days were like 18-hour days. Yeah. They, they were. They yeah. Were. From, yeah, sun up to sun down. So I can't imagine on a TV show, you're just waiting around for your time and then yep. like go get into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You think you can be an actress, Sam Cat? Um, Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't mean to brag, but I was an extra on the show Nashville. So that's where I knew you from. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I was, yeah. you know, I I recognized you. blonde girl <laughs> yeah. number four at the time because I was wearing a blazer at whatever background shot it was. Uh, you know what? There was a time in my life that I did want to be an actress, and I actually auditioned for that movie Stick It. I was a gymnast growing up, and they were All filming. Right. Originally, they were casting like actual gymnasts to make this movie. Right. And then. Obviously, that didn't work out, but it was quite an experience. I don't know that I would have lasted in that field. I think that I've made the right choice, but I think it's cool to hear. I think for someone who consumes on like the the audience side, it's always fun to hear what the behind the scenes is really like because although I've never been on 150 TV shows and movies, there are a lot of things that you have to do that are not sexy, like 18 hour days and hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait and be on. And I think it kind of might get glamorized that it's like such an easy lifestyle or it's just like you breeze in, you record, you go home. So it's nice to kind of hear that, you know, everybody is still human and it doesn't matter which road you chose for a profession. There are positives and negatives or strenuous times, but it's just like, I don't know, it's kind of interesting to hear perspective. I work in the music industry, which I feel like is can kind of mirror that where people think it's always sex drugs and rock and roll and it turns out like no there is a lot of hurry up and wait backstage as well a lot of i mean being paid for your time instead of maybe doing physical labor or physical work at the time and it's just kind of like a i don't know like eye opening and a reminder for those of us that are out here that are just quote unquote normal people that didn't make it as an actress that yeah. won't ever be the lead singer of a band type of thing Locks, locks and <laughs> and locks agrees with me. Hey, buddy. Passy time. He keeps spitting it out. Sorry, he just really wanted to add on to that. Maybe locks will be an actor. Hey, we'll see. We'll put him in there. He could be. He could be the Gerber baby. We got to get the incentives in Tennessee and make it a lot easier. <laughs> then you don't have to leave. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. 
We'll get all that in place. Yeah, I want, I want to film everything here. So there's enough actors in town now that we and people from the industry that we we could literally build the industry here, like Atlanta, like Georgia did. A lot of people say that Nashville's becoming a mini LA. How do you feel about that? <laughs> it's not anything like <laughs> LA. <laughs> Look, LA is yeah. like oh, it's never going to be like LA. Yeah, yeah. So all the all this stuff that Hollywood brings that's not um good i think we we could have all the good things that hollywood does have yeah. and i think it does have a lot of good things like i'm having this premiere on uh next tuesday night i'm going to make it a lot of fun for everyone to kind of put the spotlight on my show but also the people here in nashville um it's fun you, yeah. know, you celebrate you know yeah that was one good thing that hollywood would do so growing up in the spotlight movie star dating other movie stars yeah <laughs> let's talk about that yeah i did just said, yeah. <laughs> yeah i did yeah you can't help yourself i know you yeah. can't yeah. yeah is it something where you get um nervous about with your kids because i saw something where you said you oh, had yeah. to explain oh yeah 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 to your yeah, son my son's gonna ha my son's starting to get to the age where he starts asking questions yeah so i just wanted him to know you know it's okay to ask those questions like and the the narrative that may be out there like you know just make it the truth right you know yeah i take responsibility on my side yeah all right do you have i mean obviously you're a big family man now what if your son came to you and said i want to get into this dad i'd like to be an actor i want to move to so, hollywood so i just did a film and they had a a, a 10 year old i had a 10 year old son in it and he doesn't say anything <laughs> so i was like well, you know, I could have him down there while I'm filming. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. And um, it didn't work out that he, he got the role because he actually cast an actor an actor for that role. Um, but yeah, I do think I, I'll put him on there. He's, he looks, he looks, he's good looking. You know, he's going to be a good looking <laughs> kid. Yeah. And so one thing I learned, like you got to figure out what you're good at and being good looking you know, it helps you in certain areas yeah. and definitely helps you if you're an actor. <laughs> yeah. So he's got even better looks than I had. And that led me pretty far in life. So right. if that's what he wants to do, he'll do it right. He's got someone who can help him. Um, he'll have, he'll have the same mentors, you know, look up to that I did. Yeah. You know, like the work ethic that you talked about, like I learned how to play when, when I worked with Tom Hanks, I learned how hard he works and that the results of watching him perform are because he works so hard on whatever he's doing. He does all the research. He goes, you know, bonkers on whatever he's doing. He's been doing it for so long. We forget, but he's the guy who lose 35 pounds for a role. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so I had that work ethic. I bring it to my son and, yeah. and work hard. If he works hard, it doesn't take it to, if it comes easy, then it comes easy. If he wants to work harder and, you know, gets that part that makes a difference, then good for him. Right. And something huge right now in the past couple of weeks, the um, documentary Quiet on Set with Nickelodeon. Oh, yeah. Have you seen any of that? No, but I know about I was I was the chairman of the board for the child sexual assault for the Screen Actors Guild for a short period of my life. And I was on the board of Rain. Um and I was a board of a group called Snap Survivor Network. Uh, uh, so I, I'm always been involved in that. So I, I I heard all the stories about that. I heard it from the survivors, and yeah, that's that's one of the horrors that Hollywood had. Like they right. had this world that no one was being held accountable, and the and you know stuff happened. We saw it all. You know, from yeah. the Harvey Weinstein to this. Yeah, and there's a lot more stories out there, and I. I would hope that if I hope that that story helps other survivors to reach out and, you know, find themselves because I was sexually assaulted um, in the very beginning of my career by someone who had done it over and over and over again. And if I had known, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Um, but I didn't know. I just didn't even know that existed. Right. You know, my dad didn't say, oh, when you're, you know, worry about the director coming on, you know, didn't do that. We didn't know that. Um, so I I heard a podcast talk this, this morning about that uh, show, and it's important for parents to to be able to talk to their child. Like in that 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 story was the one actor, the he was dating a girl, and the girl's mother, 
mother was the one who realized like right something was really wrong mm -hmm. like that at the 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 director or the producer was acting completely out of normality and that's how they uncovered this whole thing so i think it's important for uh anyone if you do have a child in the industry not to be scared to death of everyone mm -hmm. but to just never leave your child alone with an adult yeah and that's one thing i learned from working with all those networks and um all these survivor groups is you'd never leave your child alone with an adult there. You cut it all off. The boys, um, boy scouts, they, they take kids out in the middle of nowhere. Right. That's how they prayed on them. Right. Um, church, uh, you know, come back here and, you know, serve, serve your, you know, get back, whatever, you know, mm, that yeah. whole thing with the Catholic church. So they were always alone with their the kids, and um, that's a really good lesson for people to say: just don't leave your alone with a coach. Um, and if you do, just document the whole thing, right? Um, and don't think it's so strange that you've got to be embarrassed that you have to do that. Like that's life. Like you take care of your children, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Trust that gut instinct. Yep. Because more times than not, it's correct. Since we got a little one in here. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Because when I was watching, I haven't seen the whole thing, but I was like, "Where are all the parents here? Like, what's going on?" Yeah, and you know, it's a lot of about the power dynamics, uh, even with the parents, because they want their child to work, right? But th so they're really, they give a little more boundaries to these producers and directors mm -hmm. instead of just realizing like there's morality. <laughs> just, just yeah. you know, you don't need, don't need to do that. You don't need to let your kid go to the amusement park with this guy alone. It's yeah. just, you don't do that. Corey Feldman always talked about, you know, he was a child actor. So he was, and, yeah. It was, yeah, it's prominent. It was prominent in the younger in the eighties, nineties. It's still, you know, it was still in certain parts of uh, Hollywood. Yep. Do you think that if I mean now, I feel like <clears throat> it is. I don't want to say common, but it is way more well known. Kind of like the secrets, especially in just sex trafficking or underage Hollywood, like you're describing. Do you think that it was just there was so much that eventually that bubble was going to burst and everybody was kind of kind of see these people for who they were? Or do you think it was social media that kind of, you know, like fanned these problems that yeah, made them bigger, made media, the fire yeah. bigger? It was Rose McGowan mm -hmm. been talking about Harvey Weinstein since the, it happened. Yes. And she could never get a voice. Like, you know, we know we learned from being on social platforms, like you have a voice, right? <clears throat> But she, her voice wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. It couldn't get above that all the mm -hmm. naysayers, right? <clears throat> then within, I think it was a lot to do with the uh, with Donald Trump becoming president. That's what she told me. She said when Donald Trump became president, it gave voice to every, gave voice to the oppressed, because it was so out there. Mm -hmm. Everything was out there then. Mm -hmm. And so she said, it was the first time I ever was heard on Twitter. And then it blossomed into this whole thing with, Har you know, Harvey going to jail, being in jail and <clears throat> being held accountable for what he's done for those, those actresses all mm -hmm. along. So I do think that social media really made a difference. See if it, like, you could say something now on, on those platforms and you'll never be heard. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then mm -hmm. you, the shame would cover you up and you would never want to speak out about it. For some reason, during that course of that time with Rose, she spoke out and it was a chain reaction. Yeah. And then everyone had, maybe they had their own voice and they, like the Me Too movement, allowed everyone to come together. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't just one voice. It was like everyone was on the side going, yeah, we're going to expose this. Mm -hmm. And that le led to uh, child trafficking. I mean, how many times have you heard about it over the course of your life? And I, I, I knew it was happening, but I never thought it was happening like in my backyard. Right. You know? And it is, yeah, you know, it's, and now it all kind of makes sense. And uh, yeah, we, we put a light on it, but then again, so there was a movie that won the Academy Award called Spotlight. It was about the chief, the priest um, molesting the children in the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. It didn't stop. Yeah. It won the Academy Award and it didn't stop. No one took, no one held them accountable for what they did mind-blowing they just moved the priest to the next parish right? it's unbelievable yep. do you feel in your situation do you feel a lot of anger 
and saying that, you know, it was known that this person was abusing people I, and I, that I, nobody warned you or nobody tried to help or. No. Well, because I, I, I heard Rose speak out and then when I started doing research and like, you know, Bruce Robinson won Academy Award for uh, 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 some movie he and it happened to him and the same director did what he did to me to him and he he, I, he was like drunk on a talk show and that's how i found it out so they he was drinking his problems away you know so i i i learned in my i'm sober so i learned in my sobriety that you know, I have to take that and give it over to a, a higher power mm -hmm. and uh, work through it. And I did tons of EM, EMDR and uh, brain spotting to get past the trauma because trauma is like a time traveler. It catches up with you in time. So so when I was able to get, I, I was able to process it through. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not angry. And yeah. Franco is who he is and it's his problem. It's not mine. Yeah. You know, he took it to his grave. And yeah. Maybe he tried to make amends. He never tried to make amends with me, but maybe he tried to make amends to his higher power. Right. Congrats on sobriety. Yeah. And I know that I'm sober too for over a year and a half. And That's awesome. Yeah. 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 I love it. But like you're saying, I feel like uh, with trauma, you start dealing with it more when you become sober because Absolutely. you used to just drink it Man, away. Absolutely. That's the whole key, right? Yeah. You stop numbing yourself. Yeah. Then you start to look at yourself and you're able to get through those things. Yeah. And then you're free on the other side. So that's where I am. I'm free. I'm not angry. That's got to be a good feeling. It is. Yeah. It's good for my children too. Yeah. Yeah. I get to be present with them. Nothing better. Yeah. Hot locks, buddy. He's actually <laughs> snoring is over he? here. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's, really? he's kind of calmed down a little bit, but for a bit he was snoring. I don't know if you could hear him over there or not, but <laughs> he's living his best life. So getting into dad life some more, he says the greatest thing ever. And, um, when you're working now, you obviously make it a point to fly home Yeah. and, um, you know, do you think it's tough balancing a career in Hollywood or Nashville and being a dad? Oh, it definitely is but yeah. putting priorities yeah. like my, my family's first. Mm -hmm. Um, then I found Blue Ridge, like, yeah. and they, it's all about family first. Even my son, me, my son's going to the premiere. Um, he's 10 years old. Yeah. He's going to sit down and watch it. So, nice. so it's like, I, I finally am part of something I'm so proud to talk about that everyone can bring their children and watch my show. You know, no one's going to be naked in it. They're not going to make some, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, blood's not going to be splattered right. across the wall. Yeah. It's a family friendly. Yeah. It's family event. friendly. Yeah. You got to talk about Ellen DeGeneres. Oh man, because we went out to dinner once and you told me this story. Oh, I'll try to see if I can do this. So I, I did a, a stand up routine. I said, Oh my God, what did I say? Um, which one of these blonde icons did I kiss? A, Madonna. Mm -hmm. B, Ellen DeGeneres. C, Heather Locklear. D, Christina Applegate. Or E, all of the above. E, all the above. All the above. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and then it's, it's funny. It's not a bad list. It's funny. I'm not like saying <laughs> people I slept with. I was married to Christina. I did yeah. a movie with Heather. I went on a date with Madonna and I was Ella DeGeneres' beard. The beard. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know the beard, and it was a legit thing back in the day, right? Because yeah, she hasn't come out of the closet yet. Yep. And you were just her. Fake boyfriend. I was her fake boyfriend. And she pulled me in close and gave me a big kiss on the red carpet. Never forget that. How did you she get that, that role? Yeah, how did you I was gonna say, was there an audition for that as well? Or did you read we lines? Were, we we had the same manager and we would go to this place called Esalen up in Big Sur. So it was like this I just loved her. She was she's awesome. She and I could see like, wow, that's a big deal. Like, no problem. I got you. And you know, I, um, you remember, did you see the Grammys where Tracy Chapman sang? Yes. That was awesome. Okay. That so was the best. I remember I was watching that and she started singing it and it hit me 19, like 90 in Ellen's living room. It was me and a bunch of lesbians <laughs> and this black girl came, got up, grabbed her guitar and started singing. And it was Tracy Chapman. She sang that song. 
the entire room was just filled with tears and joy and they were it was just the most amazing thing we've ever heard just saying right in the living room i texted you yeah after tracy yeah. chapman played yeah. that night it's incredible one of the greatest songs of all time i'd say i yeah. also just think the resurgence of that song what 30 years I later know. I mean, that was an iconic moment for just pop culture in general. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like it's, I, I think that, I don't know the numbers, so please don't quote me, but the amount of streaming she got on the OG song from just that Grammy performance was like wild. X amount of millions more than she's had in the last 10 years combined or something like that. Um, and as it should be. Yeah. Very well earned. It's the best. It was iconic. Because you're like, how do you not know that song, right? To the right. Gen Zers right. who you keep talking about. But then they boost these very deserving artists. And yeah, it's they like think the same... Luke Combs did it. I know. That's <laughs> and I'm crazy. Like, no. Yeah. No, no, no. But even like the song from Stranger Things. But you know what? It made me like him. <laughs> True. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? I was yeah. like, oh, he's cool. He's an artist. I'm, I I'm do. Gonna, I'm going to start following that guy. I love the, like I said, I mean, I feel like I... It sometimes dive in and maybe get a little jaded and I don't notice how cool it is that Luke Combs opened the door for all of these young kids to know who Tracy Chapman was but at the same time yeah, vice versa people who didn't know who Luke Combs was or even like Beyonce put out a country album now and everybody's kind of like crisscrossing over I love I think that's like one of the coolest things about being an artist or an actress or whatever it may be the amount of quote unquote power you have to open the door and open people's eyes and perspectives and even their preferences now, just like you said, oh, I'll be a fan of his now. And all it was was one performance on the Grammys that allowed that to happen. I mean, I don't want to diminish it. It wasn't all it was, but you know what I mean? I yeah. like that it's kind of just like, who knows, you you can open doors and windows in any direction without even maybe even knowing how much of an effect you're going to have. I love that. Yeah, me too. Part of the creative space. I feel like yeah. it's infinite. Yeah. And listening to him talk about how that that song was such a big part of his life. Yeah. You know, and, and then he records it. And, and what a moment oh, for yeah. them. It was amazing. That was awesome, wasn't it? Even I was more so. my eyes out. Yeah. I, 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 just, I cry a lot, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it takes things same. like that to make me cry. So kind of on that same path, Luke obviously put Tracy on a pedestal and that song meant a lot to him. I know you've mentioned Tom Hanks a handful of times here, but is there anybody else that you worked with or worked for that started out as maybe a mentor that's now a friend or became a friend throughout the process that you still idolize in a way? Well, the, Tom is definitely the one because he's just, he's, I consider him my good friend. Um, and he's just been, he's been there no matter what. But I got, you know, good buddies that I, artists, peers, yeah, they're, you know, they, you would think we would be up for a competitive, but we are tight. Like they tell me what's going on. <laughs> they're like, you know, so like Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Frank Grillo, I mean, both of them are just amazing human beings, amazing actors. And they're, they fill me in whatever they can. And, you know, the, we always talk about family first. Mm -hmm. Um Nick Gonzalez is a dear friend of mine that actually called me and told me, I asked him, I was like, I, I, I'm not, I don't have an agent anymore. I left Hollywood. I left everyone behind. You know, anyone that would, that was looking for a you know, leading man. I want to get back into being a leading man. And he's the one to set me up with Gary Wheeler. Who's the producer of Blue Ridge. And it was a TV movie that we shot that they turned into a television series. So I don't know how that really happened, but mm -hmm. it was all because I asked my friend Nick Gonzalez for help, and he and he get, got me help, the right help. Kind of found the spirit and moved it right in line. With social media now, what direction do you think Hollywood's going in? Do you think it's as simple as, you know, you see these people blow up overnight, they get millions of followers just doing skits on TikTok or Instagram, um, a lot different than what it used to be when you were growing up. If you wanted to get into the business, you want it to be a big time actor. What's the route to go? Hmm. I think you got to study acting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, no. And I act. actually think that I think that the key is to be the best actor possible. That way, you're checking all the boxes. Um, it's one thing I've, I've realized now that at my age, like I have a wealth of knowledge as an actor. 
just from doing it for so long and studying it as hard as I, I have. You know, I play a tough, like they, they talk about me being a tough guy in this Blue Ridge. I mean, I'm not really a tough guy. I'm not. If something happens to my family, look out. We're in trouble. Yeah. But I'm not that guy, you know, but I play one on TV. I'm an actor. Same thing with that. So I didn't sing that song, but I played it because I'm an actor. So I think that acting is the way to go for anyone to really study acting, look at it from different ways, study with different teachers and to put yourself in front of that camera or on stage and learn how to perform because perform is a performing art. What's like the number one tip as far as the performing, the art of it, the art of acting. If you were to do acting one-on-one, you're starting with somebody who's never acted. Is there a tip that you're like, you need to do this? Well, it's the art of living. So you need to learn how to live your life. So you need to learn yourself. That's what, the first thing I would tell an actor. And then there's things like, you know, knowing what the camera does as, as opposed to working on stage mm -hmm. with another actor. Um, you need to learn how to listen and communicate and connect. Um, you need to know what you're going after, what's in the, what's in the way and how you're going to go get it. So action over top of an obstacle towards your goal. Mm -hmm. Those are the beginning steps. Boleslavsky's first six steps are concentration, characterization, dramatic action, rhythm. Um, and there's two other ones, but like the, all mm -hmm. those things combined are really kind of like, once you kind of get those things that you can move anywhere mm -hmm. as an actor. Interesting. There you go, Booth. There we go. That's you want to do step? it? You could be an actor. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. What role? Well, you <laughs> you would probably be a romantic leading man. Oh my God. Oh, thank you. Don't you think? Yeah. You yeah. got a little Ryan Gosling going on. Yeah, over I can there. do a notebook. <laughs> yeah. I love that guy. I followed I started following Nicholas Sparks. I'm like, what's he gonna do next? Notebook is awesome. Is notebook is great. Him? Walk to remember. That was a good one. Speaking of crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, people say I look like the guy from Sweet Home Alabama, too. No. Oh, yeah. You Jack already Lucas. did this to me. Yeah. Josh Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Leading actor in a ro romance, Sam Cat. You heard it. Yeah, I, I mean, you know what? I think you can do whatever you put your mind to. That's right. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess anybody can be what they want to be if they work hard at it, but. That's right. Who was the worst actor you've ever been on set with? <laughs> the worst actor? Yeah. Let's cut to the chase. <laughs> Give us, now this is the real behind the scenes. Yeah. I'm blanking on her name. Okay. <laughs> sure you but are. She's very famous. She's, an, she's a supermodel. All right. Um, Blonde hair. Black hair, black girl. Tyra S Banks. No. <laughs> Above Tyra. Really? Naomi Campbell. Naomi Campbell. Wow. She has quite a reputation that precedes her. So I'll tell you the story because it's so much fun. Okay. <laughs> yes, I am I'm ready. I'm shooting this indie film that I, it was 97, I think, or something like that. And, or 95, maybe it was before that thing you do. And it was an independent feature. They had some money and they cast her in this role. And I'm on set and I started learning about filming. Like you have to film, you have to get things in the can or the scenes in the back are going to suffer. And we're waiting for her on the set, waiting for her on the set. And I can't remember, it could have been around two hours. And I had to go out to knock on a trailer door and I went into the, the trailer and said, what's wrong? Are you nervous? Are you okay? I'll take care of you out there. And she's on the phone. She goes, she goes, uh, Jonathan just came in. Um, and I go, who? And she goes, R Robert, um, you know, I, I'm just scared to go out there. And I, and I, I said, can I talk to him? <laughs> it was Robert De Niro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Could you tell her to get this set? We've been waiting for like two hours. I'll take great care of her. She'll be fine. And he's like, who's Jonathan? It was Robert De Niro. She called Robert De Niro. She was so nervous. <laughs> And that's, that's the only time I've really ever talked to Robert De Niro. <laughs> 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 Who's awesome. Oh, he's awesome. He's, yeah, he's fantastic. That's wild. There's so many stories I'd love to hear about Hollywood and just the process. And yeah, but some of them I feel like I don't want to know. Like yeah. ignorance is bliss in some capacity. 
But yeah, I mean, yeah. it is fun to hear the dirty details. Yeah. You want to know how they really are. Because like you said, I mean, you step into a character, that's not really who they are. You don't get to know them as a person. So Naomi Campbell. Everyone's different though. I mean, everyone, everyone's going through the same stuff that you're all going through. Yeah. They're just with people that are famous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like my story of abuse is, is a story with really famous people in it. Yeah. Um, but, everybody's, but it's the same yeah. pain, same shame. Yeah. Um, it's pretty much with everything. Love. Like, yeah, I was on the front cover of People Magazine with my breakup. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was hard. Same. Because I, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's brutal, yeah. right? Yeah. But everyone goes through the same, same thing. They just don't have that public. But then they do. I've learned this. Like, because they're, their world of fame in their town or their community is just as equal right the shame the pain mm -hmm. you know yeah. they have to live with it they have to live with their neighbors they have to live with their family they have to live with those people that are looking at them because the breakup whatever the breakup was who's yeah. ever fault and then they start talking about it and the guys about it yeah in a in their in their in their worlds now yeah. yours and mine was like all over the place right you know but I think it's pretty much the, same. the same. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something I learned too. Cause when I had my quick little, uh, fame thing there with all that stuff, I realized when I got there and I was dealing with all this stuff that it was just the same stuff, just more people watching. Yeah. It's know? true. Right. And so it, I felt kind of weird, like idolizing famous people after that, you know, it's a weird thing, but it, it, there is, a lot more energy behind it yeah like you have a lot of energy <laughs> yeah. so that there's a reason why you have a lot of energy yeah you know yeah interesting i have a question that we a lot might of attraction i think the law of attraction applies to him law of attraction yeah that's what the matchmaker said that's right don't forget just that's manifest right. it it'll happen um i have a question that we might cut out because this could be the dumbest thing ever but <laughs> i feel like I just love getting this perspective from anyone who's acted in any capacity. I love love. And I I, I, I want I'm, what? I feel like I know what you're gonna say. Go ahead. You probably do know yeah. what I'm gonna say because I feel like it's a very generic question. However, when you are so deep in the trenches and you're playing a role that is like passionately in love with someone, is it difficult to realize that that's not real? Or do you or do people really fall for their co- stars because it feels like how can you sit there and say all of these things to someone and kiss them and hug them and love them and they're like seen and then it's oh never mind we're not actually feeling these things has there ever been any like gray area or blurred lines that makes it difficult to do so hmm. well i think that acting actually applies because there's there's substitution is a, a tool that an actor would use and you substitute the individual that's in the scene and you put the qualities of someone that you do love sure, or that someone that you long for, um, you use the substitution, substitution, um, you use the person as well. Um, it doesn't mean you have to act out on it afterwards to know, to know the boundaries of within, I call it magic time. So when they camera, when they camera, when they say action to the time that we cut, it's, I try to create magic in that time. You used to do it with uh, the celluloid when the cellu celluloid, I think it's what it was celluloid, <laughs> big term, big word, all of a sudden don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> when it goes through the frame w with film, now digital is a little different, but when they used to say action, it was precious time. We had to, we had to make this magic happen. Um, so I think that you can make the magic and then you can go home. You know, my co-star Sarah Lancaster and I have this incredible chemistry on on camera it works it t tells the whole story within a couple frames and she explained it to me she was like well you're chasing people in the woods and i'm i'm back home and then they call me for my my time i come in and everything gets real still and then we talk and i was like wow i never thought about it like that mm -hmm. and i have to so but i don't have uh, you know I, she got a uh, family here i have my family back home sure <laughs> you know we're, we're just, we're good friends. We take mm -hmm. care of each other. We take care of the spirit of one another. Um, we keep each other um, in, at the highest level, but we don't cross over that. I think when you're younger, you know, you may, yeah. yeah. And that may happen and people may not have the conviction of themselves yet. So they force that upon the right. Yeah. 
You know, so that would happen. Yeah. So, you know, if someone doesn't have a sense of that, they may think that you need to punch someone to actually actually hit them to make it look like a punch. And that's just not yeah. the way it is in right. film. It's all smoke and mirrors. So they would fall in love with someone to, yeah. to make themselves ha feel that. Yeah. yeah. That's is what I'm going to ask. Yeah. Cause I, I watch movies and shows and you know, I'm like, that guy does not need to act right now with that girl. He's loving every part of that. He just gets a, an excuse right now that he's acting. Like there's gotta be feelings and emotions there. Cause again, like we're just saying, we're all human and we're all dealing with the same things. I feel like some people, you know, might cross that line, which we see in Hollywood, which we see couples form for movies and shows. But I always think too, I'm like, that's gotta be really hard for their wife or their husband at home. They probably don't want to watch this because they're watching their significant other in love with somebody else on TV. That's yeah. like the ultimate compartmentalization. Yeah. And it's just like, this just is work. True this is our life. Like yourself. And that's, you know, you got to have obviously trust in your relationship and that's your job. You know, it's interesting. So if, if I punch this really tough guy who's could kill, I, I did a movie one time with the, one of the deadliest men in, in the world. And when he came after me in the, in the scene, I got scared. Yeah. I was like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He's going to kill me. Yeah. And, but then I, then I realized it's just, I'm just acting. And literally he calmed me down. We went through the whole fight scene. We went back to the choreography that we had set and I was completely fine. But his ego wasn't hurt because I kick his ass in the movie, right? So that's one thing I always bring up. Like, my wife's not going to be upset because I'm in love with some. My character's in love with someone in the movie. Yeah. Um, unless you have a really bad self, low self esteem, mm -hmm. and then you really got to look at yourself and say, Yeah, what's going on? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe you had cheated on your wife and with your co-star, and then the, they were worried about that. There's a whole other thing, right? Right. Yeah. But acting is, it, look, it's a whole different spiritual level to it that yeah. I, I see that. Everyone else can't see that, but man, I have done these scenes. I've made, you know, um, I made babies in movies. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nothing like making babies in real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more choreography in that as well. It's yeah. all choreography. And you know what? You, need, you Your face has to be a certain place. You're, usually your abs got to be really tight. You know, that's what I always wondered too. I'm like, in those scenes, like, how do they make that work in that scene? You know, one thing during Me Too movement, they got uh, intimacy coordinators. Um, it's been a big stink in Hollywood. These people were actually like choreographing the sex scenes, like they do fight scenes. Yeah. But that's what I felt like we've been doing that all along. But now we have someone there to protect. Um, gotcha. But not just protect girls, protect the boys. You know, mm -hmm. protect everyone on the set. Makes it easier. Um, one thing I'd one thing I'd love to leave this with is that I have made. I feel like I have made Hollywood a better place than than how I found it. Um, that was my goal. So we got a lot of things changed to make it better, make it safer. Yeah. Uh, not everyone agrees with them, but it's definitely going to put those assholes in check. Yeah. Well, hey, we agree with you. You're a rock star. We appreciate you coming on and talking with us. And everybody at home, check out Blue Ridge and season two coming up. Season one. Season, season one. one. And I'm going to go film season two. Okay. <laughs> All right. Season one coming up. Don't miss it. Uh, thank you guys. John the Check. Always a pleasure. Sam Cat, Locks, Alex. Team on three. Team. Team. Team.